Good, perfect, thank you. Well, my name is Tad, and I'll be y'all's guy for the next trail. This will be about a 40 to 45 minute tour. Yeah, so I do like to start each tour with a little brief history for you on Charleston and Magnolia Plantation to kind of get you up to speed on what's been going on around here the last several hundred years or so while we're getting up to our first main section. Now, Charleston itself was named after King Charles II of England, and he had eight buddies, we call the eight wards proprietors, that King Charles gave the Carolina land grant to back when they were passing out all this land here in the Americas. So they took that land grant, settlers packed up shop in England across the Atlantic, and they finally hit the Americas in this area in 1670. Now, he's early settlers, they tried to grow a few things to start out with to see what about maybe 20 feet off the edge of the bank, left side, you'll see a gator in the water with the head above that duckweed there. And then we've got another gator on the platform right up here as well, on the left side, high edge of the platform, you'll see a gator looking right towards the tram, and then a couple of turtles hanging out there as well. Those are yellow belly sliding turtles. And they get decently large out here, they get about the size of a basketball, fully grown. And in captivity, those turtles can live to be like 30 plus years old. In captivity, now in the wild, they may not make it that long because alligators will eat turtles, but if they have a tank to them, they can usually live to a pretty ripe old age. Although I will say on behalf of the turtles though, that's usually the last meal a gator will go for because there's just not much meat on a turtle once you get to the shell, and it does take some effort to get through that shell, so not much reward for the work. Not going to be a, a gator's favorite meal, but they certainly will eat them if they need to. We also have box turtles in the area and snapping turtles as well. But if you come across a snapping turtle, don't mess with them. Those are vicious, aggressive turtles. They will try to bite you if you pick them up. And it does hurt if they get a hold of you. I can, I can tell you that firsthand. 
We'll have another gator coming up on the next platform. There's also a couple birds I'll point out to you right up here. And actually the one just stood up in the lower nest made it easier to see. That's a great egret. That large white bird in that lower nest of the tree. Great egret. And those are some of the taller birds you'll see in the area. Fully grown, maybe up to around three feet tall, with about a four foot wingspan. And that's a female. She was actually laying, well, she is laying on eggs. She stood up, of course, but she was laying on the eggs there. She's got a couple eggs. Well, I don't know how many, but several eggs in that nest. And they just started nesting about two weeks ago, so the eggs won't be hatching for probably another maybe week and a half or so, roughly. There's another great egret flying across the pond there as well. Beautiful birds. They are predators, though. They'll eat snakes, fish. Several years ago now, but it's still one of the larger gators caught in the last decade that's on record. They clocked in at 15 feet, 9 inches, almost 16 feet for that big dog. I don't know what they're feeding their gators in Alabama. It's kind of rare to see one get that big, almost 16 feet, but that one did, so it can happen. Another gator on the platform there, and then a couple of turtles and a gator on the last platform out there as well. So we have a ton of gators out there, no shortages in the sea. A bunch of those great egrets you'll see nesting in that rookery. That's like a great egret hotel right there. Several more in those back trees there as well. 50s. So these are quite old, and certainly the enslaved did live in these specific cabins in the 1850s and early 1860s before the end of the Civil War. And I'll tell you a little bit more about these. They're, oh no, they're actually finishing up their tour now, so we're good. I didn't want to talk while I was going by the tour, we're just not interrupt them, but they're finishing up, so we're good. But y'all will notice as we turn the corner, two doors per cabin. And there would have been two slave families living in each cabin, sharing one. One family living on one side, one on the other. And depending on the size of each family, you were talking roughly between about 10 to 15 slaves per cabin. So it's pretty tight quarters. You can see these are not that large. During peak rice production, which would have been the mid-1700s here in Magnolia, that's when the most slaves would have worked on this land at one time. There would have been roughly about 150 slaves working on the property at that point. So there's quite a few in the 1700s. I did decline over the years, and by the time the Civil War started in 1861, 100 years later, there would have been about 50 slaves working on the property at that point and throughout the Civil War. And some of those 50 during the war would have lived in these four cabins right here. Now the smaller building up here on the end, that's the old smokehouse. That's where they cured the meat and stored it for winter before refrigeration. It was built in the early 1900s. And we got another large Virginia live oak tree coming up beside us here. This one's over 300 years old and one of our larger ones on the grounds. And that wood, a lot of wood, that was a favorite for ship holders to use when they were making ships out of wood. Hard to work with because it was so tough and very heavy. But if you had a ship made out of a lot of oak back in the day, you were pretty much top of the line. Not a lot of wood going to be tougher than that. You will. A lot of those live oaks up here at the edge of the field on the right. And we're also passing by some great myrtle trees here on the right edge with that smooth, tan colored bark. Those are crepe myrtles. Quite a few of those you'll see around the property as well. So what I want to point out there here, and you can see this anywhere you look, is all the gray stringy stuff hanging off the trees everywhere called Spanish moss. Which you might be familiar with, but what you may not know about Spanish moss is that it's not Spanish and it's not a moss. It's actually an epiphyte or an air plant, which means it gets all the nutrients it needs to survive from the air, the sun, the rain, and the environment as a whole. It does not need a host to grow like regular moss does. So you'll see it clinging to different types of trees, but it's not growing from those. And I'll tell you how I got the name Spanish Moss, but there's a great blue heron doing some hunting right beside us here. Look at this. I'm trying to be quiet. I don't want to scare it away. That's a great blue heron. I mentioned when they hunt, that's what they do. It's not action packed. They'll just stand and they'll wait. Very patient. Or very lazy, however you want to look at it. But no one ever gets the job. Red. But that's all duckweed out there. Then we got cypress trees along the bank. You can always tell a cypress by the root system that surrounds it there at the base. Those knobby things, and those are called cypress knees. And that's part of the root system of the tree that sticks above the ground. 
helps provide stability for the cypress that you'll usually find in or around water. The little saying is if you have cypress knees, you have cypress trees. Don't give you cypress though with tupelo trees. Tupelos are the ones you see growing out there in the swamp. Those are tour out here if you'd like. It is a self-guided tour though, so no tour got to walk you through the swamp area, but there is much more of the Audubon you can see down through those boardwalks on your own. You get the swamp tour, what they do is write a four-digit number code on your map at the ticket booth, put that code in the gate to the left there, and that allows you access. Well, really nice in the deep swamp, great right? scenery right here for pictures. And a couple little Hollywood claims to fame here at the Audubon. The uh, first movie wasn't that great, but the movie Swamp Thing was filmed out here. They might remember Swamp Thing back in the day. But if you didn't see that, don't stress. You're not missing a ton. The, little thing the other movie is a little bit more recent. Yeah. You know, they had downtown Charleston. They filmed movies like The Notebook and The Patriot. Out here, we get Shrek and Swamp Thing. A little thing, it's pretty fitting, I suppose. There's the parking lot for the Audubon there on the left. Shot of magnolia, the white bridge, and that nice reflection off the dark water. That's all part of the gardens out there as well. Feel free to walk out there. Great for pictures. Yeah. 